Hello and welcome back to another Craig and Dave Unscripted. So uh, today we're going to be joined by guest uh, and just before I bring him on, um, we've talked a lot, especially in the last few weeks, about Smart Revise. We know loads of you are using it. In fact, recently we had what's about 1.1 million quiz questions answered in 24 hours. Phenomenal. Um, but we have a slight confession to make. <laughs> Dave and I have not written Smart Revise. Yes, we are coders. Yes, we both worked in the real world as coders in industry. But it has been a, um, a number of years, should we put it politely. Uh, since we've actually um, written any code in a real um, industry environment. Uh, so um, there's someone else behind the scenes. There's more people at Craig and Dave than Craig and Dave. So we're going to bring on stream our technical director, Mark. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is this is the man behind the magic, okay? So if you really like Smart, Smart Revise, it's because of Dave and I's brilliant ideas. And if you're frustrated by it, it's because of the bunk that you're not putting in. That's, oh, that's I it. see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, joking aside, this is, this is the man that makes it work. So the reason we've got Mark on today, really, is, I mean, it's nice to hear from teachers. We tell you what we want you to do and we tell you what coders should be like and we teach you what we think is good practice but it's nice to hear from um a man who is in the industry and uh, i mean maybe just just start mark just briefly a couple of minutes what is your background how did you get into coding and like um you don't have to mention companies if you don't want to but i mean i know you've got a huge cv you've worked for <laughs> the companies as a coder so just yeah a couple of minutes about that. Uh, lord right okay, okay. well i mean well, my academic background is I have a degree in aquatic biology. Um, Obviously. The only computing um, <laughs> qualification I have is GCSE. Um, and my headmaster told me that I'd be wasting my time doing A-level computing science. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so, so everything I know about computing beyond um, Commodore 64, because PCs weren't around, didn't exist when I did my, my GCSE, um, yeah. was, was done on a Commodore 64 um, and using, it were written in basic, procedural basic in effect. Um, so yes, yeah, so I went to university, did a few odd jobs um, and ended up ultimately using my degree in a company doing small animal nutrition. And whilst I was there, I wrote them a website um, so this go. was yeah. back when Windows 3.11, um, where the browsers didn't support JavaScript at that point. Wow. So that was fun. <laughs> yeah. That's not Windows 11 for those that are listening. It's Windows 3.11, 3.11. Yeah. <laughs> this is many years ago. I yeah. want to, to guess that this is about 1993. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, it's the, when I was at uni, the computers we were using was was Unix, and I learned Fortran seventy seven. Wow. Yeah, as a biologist, to to do um, real basic bits and pieces. Really, it was basically a foundation course. So, so we knew how to turn a computer on. Mm. Um, isn't Fortran a sort of mathematical language, isn't it? Yeah, intended for mathematical computation. Right? Yeah, so uh, the the lead up was uh, for for if you're going into the sort of any sciences, really, there's a lot of statistical analysis. Um, so being able to write your own modeling software and write your own statistical statistical analysis software was was something that you would have to do once you got beyond sort of undergrad going, you know, going up to masters and PhD style. You, you'd need to start proving the science behind your theories. And a lot of that is is big data, big number crunching. But I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that you have um in terms of you know being a coder in the real world, you have um how do we say? you've earned your stripes haven't you so you've worked for <laughs> you've worked for some big companies yeah um, yeah i mean i started off i mean like i said i did did all did the sort of building a website i put in a small business server set up um email exchange put together a network so all the sort of hands-on hardware stuff that sort of stuff um in in the first what i feel is a prop was a proper job um you know and we did we uh, our internet access was through a dial-up modem at 36k or something like that you Ooh. know and when, when, when asked what what was the number for the internet it was a series of 
And I think the beat was dee 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 dee. That was the phone number for the yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. No one knows that now. But, yeah, yeah. But but after you that, yeah. I mean, I, at least half the audience haven't got a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> and half of them will have fond memories. Well, maybe not yeah. fond. <laughs> the dial-up tones to get into the internet. Want want to check your email? Let me just connect. Oh, someone's using the phone. Hold on a moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so then I worked for um, Book Club Associates, if you remember them. Um, so they they were the guys who used to do the whole sort of um, buy buy a set of books really cheaply, and then you contracted to buy lots of books at full price for the rest of your life, sort right. of thing. Well, right, not yeah. quite the rest of your life, but yeah, it was it was difficult to get out of. So I worked for them for a bit, and then I moved on working for the NHS for quite a while. And from that, and all of this was in in a coding stroke support capacity. So it was, you know, write, writing code to support websites and writing code to support other, you know, other internal bits and pieces and supporting finance systems and servers. So there's there's a, a mix of writing software, writing code, maintaining other people's software, and sort of hands on desktop support. Um, and then I went on to work for a finance software house. Now that was that was the breakout of into the private sector um, and writing writing proper code. So we were now writing our own software for banks. Um, and yeah, that, and that's where I learned a lot of my stuff. And I went through a lot of different um, technologies at that point. I mean, when I started, it, it was still the web banks were probably still using Windows ninety five at that point. Um, moving up through XP and, and the, the service of Windows NT, um, you know, we had to get special permission to go up to, to beyond that. So that they had to get new servers to support the sort of .NET frameworks and this sort of stuff we wanted to start writing in. I remember sorry. rightly, this is, sorry, go on, Dave. I was just going to ask, what and what languages were, were, you, were you programming? So where you say that, you know, you'd gone from sort of markup languages and, scripts that kind of thing for, from websites to um what you sort of deem as real programming for real sort of private sector um what what languages are we talking about here it's it's all the microsoft stuff and really that was because of where i was coming from and learning and teaching myself by looking at the source code of other people's websites um which is how i learned markup you know the, the first website I wrote was was basically based on lots of other people's websites on the internet. Um, so it would have been JavaScript was always there once that became available. Um, and then it was ASP Classic, so VB script to some extent um, with XSLT transforms. Um, then that went to Visual Basic for a short time. Didn't like that. And then to C Sharp, which made a lot more sense to me, especially the OO side of stuff. And yeah, so it's been, you know, I started off with .NET 1.1 when it was, and, and, and some of the betas. Um, I think I've still got a book downstairs, some on ASP.NET. I'm really interested in how you went from sort of zero to understanding the, the fundamentals of code, those that early part of the journey, because... For, for myself, and I think for Craig too, our journey was, we weren't really taught at school how to program. It was a hobby on the side. There was um, no computer at my school, no. No, and so we used to just um, read code in magazines and type the code in from the magazines into the computer. Invariably, there would be mistakes that we'd have to correct. And uh, you sort of learnt by doing and twiddling with the code a little bit, tweaking it, seeing what happened, and then sort of growing in confidence to write your own small little programs. And you just kind of learn from there. But but I'm guessing for, for your journey, because you were so much older and you were already kind of um, injected into the private sector, into this industry, you, you've had to learn to program in a in a different way, I'm guessing. So how did that happen for you? How do you go from not understanding what a single line of code is or does to, you know, understanding sequence, selection, iteration, data structures? How, how do you get there? Osmosis. <laughs> um, that's a hard one because really, I think if I... If, if we start off when I started, the NHS is when I started to learn code really properly with, with the ASP Classic. Um, but I sort of knew basic before that just because it was a logical structure. 
Um, and when I was, when I was, well, I guess when I was, I don't know how old I was, I've been a kid at some point, my dad brought home a Commodore PET and on there was a text adventure game and I was bored. So I hacked it and I, I learned, ha- learned sort of basic procedural stuff before I even started doing computer GCSE without really knowing it. Cause it was just a case of, well, how does that work? Let's have a look. What happens if I do that? Oh, it breaks. Why am I saying, oh, look, I can change the text. How does it? And, and just reading those logical constructs made sense. And so by the time I actually started to look at ASP Classic, it was like, well, yeah, I know this. It's just different language. So, so really, it's what the learning journey was learning the language to put the sort of logical constructs, which I already had or that just made intuitive sense, mm. even though I didn't know what they were called. I didn't know it was iteration. I didn't know it was recursion. I didn't know that this was what the select box. It didn't, you know, it, it was like, well, if you want to do something, you know, do that. Otherwise, do that. Well, that's an if mm. statement. But, you know, it's, I it's just call really, it an if. It's really interesting because this is a very similar conversation to the one that Jack Rafferty gave us, who obviously you know, um, who we spoke to ages ago. Like, how do you, you know, how, how did you know it? How did you learn it? So well, I just kind of did it, and then when I looked at this engine, which I'd never used before, I was like, oh, well, that's similar mm. to that, and that's literally what you said. Mm. I started off in Scratch, and then I looked at Unity, and that was similar. I just had to learn there was a different mm. way of doing it, so I tried this, and you know, it's like. And this is really a, one of the things I guess I wanted you to, to talk about, which is, as I'm just going to ask it because I know what you're going to say, but this is really important. I mean, we, as teachers and you as students, you know, you look around the room and go, oh, that kid over there is, is way better programmer than I ever, am I'm ever going to be. And, you know, we have bright programmers and, and programmers who struggle and learn. So you're there, you're in industry and in comes a brand new, fresh graduate or, or you know, or, or trainee. Uh, what is it? you want what is the number one skill you're after or what's the biggest thing that is lacking is it pure raw coding talent is that the number one thing you are after it's aptitude aptitude and, and an approach and a mindset and, and a passion really and a, and a curiosity so lots, not not one thing but it all sort of munges together it's the, the thing thing when you know i've been on graduate problems i've been to, problems programs <laughs> i've been i've interviewed for them i've mentored them i brought them along and what we find is we we have graduates in some of the places i've worked who have come in from from a completely non-programming background they, they they've never written a line of computer code in their life but what they've got is they've got an eagerness to learn they've got a logical mindset you know it's it's a lot of case of you know it's it's the ability to follow a thought and, and then understand where the branches come from and follow each branch in turn, but in parallel and understand intuitively how to get from A to B and, and what the steps might need to be in between to manage that. And it's it's that that sort of logical mindset and, and the attitude to shape that sort of pattern that you see in their head into, into code. Um, everything else is just syntax. It's no different to learning a language. See, that's you really know, I'm just going to highlight one line you said at the start. We've had graduates come in before who have never written a line of code before. Yeah. So if you're there now watching this as a GCSE or an A-level student and thinking, I'm never going to be as good a programmer as X or Y. They always seem to get it. I'm always struggling. It it That is not necessary. Or you're saying that is not the biggest skill. You know, no. are you persistent? You know, are you logical? Can you step back and break a problem? If you get stuck, do you give up? Or do you take a step back and look at it from a different way? You're saying all those sort of skills are fundamentally more important in, in the real world to be a successful programmer, because at the end of the day, you don't know what language you're going to get. You might be thrown another <laughs> and different language. It's just Absolutely. In the Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the industry is moving forward so fast. There are so many different ways to do the, do the same thing. And so many ways of those are wrong and so many of them are right and a number of them used to be right but now they're wrong and some of them are wrong and now they're right so (laughs) yeah it's quite you're constantly learning you know and if the language you're writing doesn't change the units you're writing them for have suddenly moved on and stuff doesn't work anymore you know everyone loves cross-browser stuff um so 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 yeah it's it's not about how good you are right now it's how good can you potentially be um, you know, and your mileage may vary depending on which company you go to. Some companies, 
in some circumstances might just want bums on seats, people who can grind out code to fulfill the requirements and off you go again. You know, you bring in the contractors because you've got a sharp deadline. Other companies will be looking for people to hit the ground running. They need a senior developer. They've got a gnarly problem or they've got a startup they want to hit really fast. Let's bring everybody in. Lots of complex problems. Get the right people. And then other people, companies will be looking long term. We want to bring up full time employees that are loyal to us and that have got potential to grow with us in the way we want to mm. and and that's where a lot of people you know get their feet in the door you know i i don't think of all the companies i work for i don't think any of them expect you know lifetime servitude what they're looking for is someone they can have working with them for at least four to five years and get the benefit from training them up um and when we interview for people like that we're looking for the ability to learn we're looking for the passion to find out you know how does stuff work? You know, a lot of the questions, one of the one of the questions we always used to ask was, you know, how would you learn how to do something? We're not expecting you to know how to fix this problem, but what are the steps you would take to do it? You know, if you want yeah. to look at the internet, fine, do it, but show us, talk us through your thought process, Ex explain to us what is it you're thinking in solving this problem? Um, you know, lots of companies will say, okay, here's a coding problem, or here's here's some code which doesn't work, fix it. Um, what you don't want to do in that situation is keep quiet and just think hard and just, you know, go through it. You know, unless you're some sort of Superman who can go bump, 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 bump. And then at that point, the company thinks, have you seen this thing before? Um, yeah. You know, talk through your thought process because that that's what they're trying to find. That's the important thing is, you know, is how do you think? And if you think in the right way, if you have that logical mindset, if you have that passion, you know, if, if you can start to show some level of frustration where you can't work out what the problem is, and that frustration is what drives you on to keep going until that problem is fixed. Um, and I guess at the point, I, I refer to lots of things as problems, simply because it's a puzzle to be solved. You know, when someone comes to me with a, a new requirement, hey, we want to do this new sort of thing. Okay, well, the problem is, what have I got to do to make that work? Because it doesn't at the moment. It might simply be because it doesn't work right now because it doesn't exist. Um, but, but you know, for me, that that helps in my mind. Is you see everything's a problem that needs fixing, which starts to push you into a solutioneering mode all the time. Um, you know, and there are so many different facets of software development. You know, whether you're going to be a consultant or an architect or oh, I forget all the different terms because I, I do everything these days. <laughs> you do. But, but yeah, I mean, don't get scared by the size of the field of the profession. Um, you know, just, just just learn your trade and enjoy it. I mean, and that's the important thing, I guess, is, mm. is you have to enjoy it. It's, it's it, like it's, um, no, go on, Dave. I think the two, the, the two sort of words that I kind of are hooks for me in, in what you were saying there over the past few minutes are the um, the passion and the aptitude. And I, I, I'd like to maybe suggest that I could distill those two words down into into one trait that if you if you've got this, then you can be very successful in the computing field. And I, I would argue that perhaps you could distill those two words into perseverance. And if you can keep going at something and not see something as insurmountable, but to see it as a problem that needs solving, as you were saying, as you were articulating, that it, it's a challenge and it's something to be rewarded for when you overcome that challenge then mm. you've got what it takes. It's about the perseverance. Because if you've got passion, if you've got passion about something and you really want something to happen, then you're going to keep going at it, aren't you, until, until you've got to the goal. And so yeah. that is perseverance. If you've got the aptitude, then you, you've got the skill set that already tells you that problem solving is about keeping going. It's about realizing that one problem and therefore the solution will lead to a blind alley and you have to come back and you have to try something else and come back and try something else. And, um, you know, the aptitude of, of computer scientists and coders um, sort of tells them that that's a natural part of the field they're in. And if you don't get stuck, you don't learn. And, and I no, always no say to, to my students, you, you, what you need to change about the way you're working is that 
at the moment, when you get stuck, you see that as a failure. You see that as a, I've got to put my hand up and ask for help because I'm stuck. Yeah. And what I want to do is challenge that and say, no, when you're stuck is when you learn. If you are never stuck, then you're never learning anything new because you're never facing something that you can't do, right? As soon as you face something you can't do, then you are learning because you have to learn how to do the thing you don't know how to do. And, and so for me, I think the whole lot just comes down to perseverance. If you, if you just keep going, even when you're stuck, then you will be good at computer science. And I, yeah. I, Oh, I, I totally agree. And what's really interesting is, is whilst you were saying that, I suddenly remembered I wrote, um, wrote a, a sort of a, a design presentation, you know, how, how to go about designing software presentation for a, a graduate program I was, I was helping out with a, a while ago. And one of the main points was don't be afraid to fail, you know, because even now, you know, with, with 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 the stuff we're working on at the moment, you know, sometimes things come and think, I have no idea how I'm going to do that. <laughs> you know? mm. But I know it can be done. There is nothing. There is absolutely nothing within some fairly large boundaries in software development that is impossible. It's just varying levels of difficulty. You yeah. know, and and then you start to look at rep return on investment of this thing isn't impossible but it's so hard that pragmatically we probably ought to try something else. Um, yeah. But, you know, yeah. and that, then that, that mindset is really important. You're right. It's, mm. it's, it's, you just I have think, to keep um, going and enjoy. I think it. there's a problem. I think there's a problem in education. I, I, and I like to be a little bit controversial every now and then. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a problem in education. Education is set up in a way that says students can't fail. It's set up in a yeah. way that says that, you know, we should always be going forwards, that, that progression is linear, that, um, you know, we're, we're always kind of bettering ourselves by going up in our grades or, you know, wh whatever it is. And education has failed to realize the single thing that enables you to learn. And, you know, education should be about learning. That's what it's all about, right? So if education is all about learning and we agree that you learn when you're stuck and you learn when you fail because you have to backtrack and try something else, then why are we not letting people fail? You know, education should be a safety net. It should be a place that is safe to fail in. Because when you mm. fail, you learn and then you can make more progress. And I, and I think education... Um, is frightened of that failure mindset because the word fail somehow means, you know, it, it's a it's a disaster. And yeah. I think we should be challenging that. I, I think failure is something we should embrace. I, we all fail every day, don't we, in some yeah. way or another. Why, why don't why doesn't education embrace failure? I think I think there's a problem. I do think there's a real problem here that uh, we think that progression is is linear, and it's not. Yeah, there's a lot of connotations associated with the word failure, isn't there? And it's it, maybe all it needs is a vocab vocabulary change uh, in a, in the context of of where, what you're talking about, you know? Because failure, fa I don't know that is there is ever failure in software development. It's just things didn't work the way you expect, and it's the same with science, right? You know, I spent a lot of my educational years doing experiments which didn't kind of work out the way that you thought they might but they were never failed experiments something not doing what you were expecting it to do or anyone else expected to do is as legitimate an outcome as a result of that experiment as as what you know was supposed to happen because you haven't failed to discover something you've discovered something else um you know and it, it, you're right it's exactly the same way in software development um you know, just because the result on a screen is not what you thought it was, okay, that's what it should have been. Well, investigate, yeah. find out why it is the way it is and store that away because you never know in some, you know, in the future, you may find that particular pattern of, of, of code is, is what you need to solve a different problem. 
So, I mean, it's worth pointing out to our viewers that that when we, you know, approached you to work for Craig and Dave, you'd already had huge amounts of commercial experience, as you said, massive public bodies like the NHS can't get much bigger, you know, big private software warehouses, financial systems, you know, the whole nine yards. During that time, I'm, well, I know you've had a number of roles from junior developer up to technical project leads and all sorts. So, obviously, you came into uh, programming for us. And, I mean, you knew absolutely everything you needed to know to, to program smart. <laughs> advice didn't you <laughs> no I mean, that's the point so yeah we, i mean i don't and i'm not just saying this to flatter you i don't think we could have got someone better i think we you know so thank you you i don't think we could have got someone better with more skills and all those things you talked about you know perseverance analytical mind logical thinker but you know you hit the ground with all that experience in massive companies and um there was a whole bunch of stuff that you was like never done that before and, no. and so it's, 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 isn't it? If you just carry on learning, like, okay, fine. Don't know how to do it. I'll find out yeah. how to do it. I'll muck about until I get it right. And I remember you know, when you started on that journey, I'm specifically thinking about obviously the UX work, yeah. the joke at the start, like, oh, I'm not a UX guy. I'm not an interface guy, back end server side architecture. And it all seemed awfully slow, the progress. And then now it's like, you're like, well, hey, you're a UX wizard. I, I know we're not meant to say that, but it's, it's out there now, I'm afraid. But, <laughs> You just carry on learning, don't you? It's, it's no different. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's 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 a skill set. So, you know, it's you can't know everything, can you? That's the trouble. No. The, the, the no. field is so big, you can't know everything. And yeah. to pick a very specific, Craig's picked one example in terms of UI. You know, you started work on Smart Advice, and we got the basics in place. And almost the first thing we said is, right, well, we need a decent contemporary front end. And you said, well, I, I don't program front ends. And so, well, you do now. And yeah. you sort of, you know, you I sort of live from there. If I, if I pick something else out that's a, a very recent development with our, our latest smart tasks mode in Smart Revise, we had a requirement that we wanted to be able to uh, set tasks in advance and we wanted to have deadlines and we wanted to be able to, um, you know, attach dates and time times to when these these things become available to students and that's not something we we'd done before now at face value to Craig and I it seems pretty pretty straightforward right you have a date field it, it isn't that difficult like but of course when you start <laughs> analyzing it and you realize actually well you can say that but you you live in England guys what about the user that's living in America what about the user that's living in um India I, I mean you know, it, the, the time zone for you is different to the time zone for everybody else. So there's another layer of complexity. And and that's something that you had to learn about because you hadn't had to deal with that uh, um, before. Mm -hmm. And it's it, that's a good example, I think, of where you've, um, you know, got, got a challenge, uh, got a challenge and then had to sort of analyze it, realize what all the difficulties are, and then sort of pick them off one by one until you get to a, to a solution that you're happy with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, every day's a school day, I'm afraid, even when you finish school. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But but if you enjoy it, that's not a problem. You know, if you're not enjoying it, do something yeah. else. And, and as you were saying, just yeah. to carry that example forward a little bit further, you, you, um, you worked out a way of, you know, programming the date and time functionality. And, uh, and then we realized that, well, I didn't realize, but you, you realized that then in a, in an upcoming sort of iteration of the .NET framework, suddenly that had become easier because it, it had new built in functions that enabled you to do some of that stuff. So yeah. as you were saying earlier, the things that you know now become redundant in the future because the, the field is always evolving. And so yeah. you learned something to solve the problem. And then it was almost immediately superseded with a better, better technology that we could then we could then use. And you had to kind of learn that again, as it were, in order yeah. to implement oh, it, it in a new it way. It gets even better because because what will what will happen, I suspect, um, is that some of the things that I had to put in to support what we're doing right now will become bugs when the next version of the framework comes out mm -hmm. because stuff changes so so you know and and you'll you'll get this with you know it's it's, it's just an industry thing there are breaking changes when software updates mm -hmm. and and when you're building on software on top of somebody else's software you know so so we use a .NET framework and we write c sharp and that's you know created by microsoft um so we're using microsoft software to write our software and you know they 
I, I suspect they write the framework in, in C sharp anyway. Um, and then it's recompiled down via IL, et cetera. Um, but yeah, but what, what will happen is, is you get the updates. It's, oh, here's a new version of .NET. OK, great. And here's what no longer works. And here's the things which don't exist anymore. And here's the things which do exist, but they behave in a different way to the way they used to. So then you have to go through all your code base and identify, well, which bits of those do I use? Which bits no longer work? Which bits do work? So, so you know, there, there's lots of things. There are so many different branches of that, software development. I mean, that, and that might surprise students to hear that, actually, that, you know, they won't, you won't hear them surprised that there'll be newer and newer versions of programming languages or programming language frameworks coming out, and they'd expect them to have more and more and more functionality. But it'll probably surprise a lot of students to hear that new functionality can break old stuff, not just build on it. And we've got a word for that in the industry. I mean, it's called deprecate, isn't it? It's like, well, yeah. that's a deprecated feature. It doesn't work like that anymore. If you've still got code that works like that or uses this function or this method or whatever, that then that will not work. You now need to be using this library or this way of doing it. So it's, um yeah, it's not yeah. a matter of being the smartest program on the block, is it? It's kind of wrapped no, up no, 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 everything no. you said. It's it's persistence, perseverance, a logical mind. It's it's a passion and a fun for it. If you've got that, then everything else can be learned on the job. I think yeah. that's really important. I, I mean, as as my sort of yeah. fi final sort of take on all this, uh, just, just to make everyone aware, I might have mentioned it on a previous episode. I can't remember, but. Um, my son is currently doing a degree apprenticeship with Aston University and um, a software developer um, north of Cheltenham. And um, when he went for his interview, he had to do a normal sort of HR interview and then he had to do a technical interview. And uh, I was a bit apprehensive about what the technical interview might entail, you know. Yeah. And they gave him a little bit of heads up and said, well, um, we do all our code in Java. So we're going to be talking to you about, about Java. And we're interested in your, uh, your experience with Java. And uh, I, I said to my son, I said, I think, we've, I think we've had it. Because he, um, through GCSE, he did Python. Most students do. At A level, he didn't really get taught any programming. Um, he had a change of teachers, and the teacher wasn't confident with programming, and it was all a bit of a nightmare, really. And uh, he he just did a little bit more Python and managed to kind of get through his programming project and whatnot with with Python, and hadn't really learned much more than he was doing at GCSE, apart from doing a little bit of hobby stuff on the side. But, you know, he wasn't really doing a huge amount. And, and I said, oh, I think we've had it. You know, there's, there's not much we, we can do about this. Or but... supported father. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But hey-ho, son, off you go. Do <laughs> and, and anyway, what they what they did in the in the interview is they said, right, well, we're not actually going to give you Java. What we'll do is we'll give you Greenfoot, um, which is, you know, an IDE and it's got Java built into it and it's, you know, got a few frameworks to make a few things a little bit a little bit easier and whatnot. Um, he'd never used Greenfoot um, ever. And uh, he said, right, we'd like you to write a program that, uh, that does the following. He's never written a line of Java code in his life before. And uh, he said, well, um, okay, uh, now, he sort of fumbled along a little bit, a bit of Google on the side, you know, how do I do this in Java sort of thing? Bumbled along. Uh, and I just thought, oh, this is hopeless. You know, there's, we got, we got no, what we're going to do here. And um, the, the sort of the, the, the senior developer on the other end said to him, you know, talk me through what you're thinking at the moment. And he said, well, I want to do this and I want to do that, but I don't know the syntax for this. And he said, well, why do you want to do that? Well, I want to do that because that will enable me to do this. And that might be a problem, but I want to try that first. And if it doesn't work, then I'll, I'll go with this. But I would need to know the syntax for it because I've only got experience with Python. And anyway, this kind of went on for, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour or so came out of it and he said that I couldn't do any of the program I, I I probably there were like 12 objectives and I probably did two of them and I said well you gave it your best shot son it's, you know and uh, anyway he got the apprenticeship and uh, you know there were hundreds of candidates and and he got uh, there were only two places and he got one of the two places and I and I was really I was quite frightened by this because 
What I also knew, because there was a, a group event that went with all this as well, there were a couple of lads on there that were Javaing it up. You know, they were Java, 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 Java. They'd clearly been taught Java at school. And they were coming up with all sorts of questions and all sorts of things. And I thought, oh, well, here we go. We got no chance against the, you know, private education students got no chance against any of these. My lad that went to the comprehensive down the road. And um, anyway, he got the job. And I was like, you've got to find out how you got that job because I'm amazed. And uh, he came back with, and, you know, the feedback was, <laughs> It wasn't about Java. We, yeah. if, if you already know how to program in Java, then there's not much for you to learn, and we want you to learn. What we are interested in is your problem-solving skills. Well, and we're going to give you something you can't solve because we want to know how you would go about it. If you, if, we, if you managed to solve that problem, you wouldn't have got the job. And I was like, wow, didn't see that coming. If, yeah. But hang on, if you solved the problem, you wouldn't have got the job. That seems a bit harsh. It depends what they're after, I, though. You know, I get it. I get what you're saying, though. It's yeah, that is interesting. It's right. It wasn't about raw coding ability, was it? No, it was how no, because right. yeah, that's it's really a degree important. apprenticeship. He he's not there yeah. to be a senior developer. Yeah, he's there yeah. to learn as a junior programmer and yeah. you know learn the next frameworks and the next frameworks and you know evolve with the business. That's what he's yeah. there to do. And what he so they've got an aptitude, an aptitude yeah. to learn, a logical approach. Yeah. yeah. So they've got a five-year development plan for him to bring him up to where they want him to be. And a lot of companies would rather bring you up to where they want you to be than have to untrain all your bad habits that maybe um, an A-level teacher or a lecturer gave. It's like, no, yeah. we've got in-house. Yeah, there you go. We've got in-house standards, and we'd rather start with a blank slate and someone who's keen and eager. Yeah, again, interesting. So it's, I think, Mark, I, I absolutely agree with you. I didn't know what you were going to say today, but I I do think, it, yeah, aptitude, it, it yeah. definitely is. It, it's following that passion and um, having the desire to learn. And if you've got that, I think you'll be successful at anything, really, not just coding. Well, this is it. This is it. It's if, if you've got the mindset to do to do the job, it doesn't matter whether you've got the skills in it or not. It All, all that affects is at what level you come in at. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Well, brilliant. I think that's a, that's that's been excellent. I mean, I kind of knew what you were going to say, to be honest, but it's <laughs> nice to hear it from a, a real developer and a real coder, because I'm not sure we can classify ourselves as one anymore. Yes, we can code, but if we started coding smart revised, well, Mark wouldn't let us anywhere near it. Yeah, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the end, though, is it? Final thing from me, it's, it's not the end. Mark is going to come back because yes, we're cool. going to do a sort of coding with Mark sort of uh, few. Yeah, now we've introduced session. them to you all. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we're going to actually kind of look at some smart revised code, and Mark's going to take us on a journey on sort of you know what what he's doing to develop various things because we know that students will be really interested in actually having a look at the code of smart revised, and so we'll uh, we'll share some few bits and pieces with you. I think that'd be that'd be really yeah. interesting. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Mark. Well, bring you're welcome. back in the future. So yeah, you now know it's Craig and Day with an asterisk and there's a little mark underneath there somewhere. So there's no... <laughs> Good. <laughs> I don't mean it like that, but I'm not changing the company name. Right. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>